Well, hey, would y'all just start by giving Jesus a big hand clap for all the good he's doing in our county. I don't know why I didn't tell Jeffrey he had to preach today. Then he could preach with all the emotion in this room instead of me, but I guess I was going to take it easy. I'm sure going to look forward to November 7th, though. I hope you mark your calendar. And I want to say something. Has anybody noticed that society is going crazy? Can I see your hand if you've noticed? It's going crazy. It hadn't been like this since the 60s. And just so you know, I was there in the 60s. I remember when the Beatles told us, all we need is love and Na, 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 na. And uh, man, things went crazy. You may not realize this, but uh, from when I was a kid in the 1960s until now, trust in government was 78% in 1960. It's 22% today. Church membership was 73% in 1960. It's 47% today. So you can look at every chart, and when the craziness and the chaos of the 60s hit, everything that was good went this direction. But I got a good word for you this morning, and that is we're having craziness and chaos again, but this time God has prepared his church. God has positioned his church, and we're going to see things go the other direction, y'all. God's getting ready to do a great work in our country. Amen? And uh, so I want us to prepare our hearts. That's why the book of Acts was written, to prepare God's people, to bring forth the passions that are in his heart. So let's pray together. I'm going to pray the same prayer we prayed every uh, teaching in this series. And, of course, repetition brings remembrance, right? So I'm going to ask you, would you pray it with me? Would you say, Lord, what we know not, teach us, what we have not, Give us, and what we are not, make us, for the glory of Jesus, and so we have a great reward, in your name, amen. Three times in the epistles, Paul begins a topic this way. He says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant about this fact. The first time he did it was in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, when he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, that so you won't be conceited that Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of Israel's providential place in history, because if you're ignorant, you're not going to pray for Israel, you're not going to support Israel, and I have plans for the world that I plan on bringing to pass through Israel. But then Paul says there's another reason that Paul didn't want us to be ignorant about God's providential plan for Israel, and that is because as believers, we could become conceited, and we could begin serving God how we thought we wanted to serve him, and when we do that, we could end up missing out on God's better plan for our life. The second time that God said this phrase through Paul is in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, when Paul wrote, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about those who've fallen asleep, lest you should sorrow as others do who have no hope. And so Paul was saying at our funerals as Christians, we obviously have even greater grief because when people love well, that causes the grief to be greater, not lesser in people's hearts. But Paul said, make sure at your funerals that when you're grieving, that's appropriate, but make sure that you celebrate eternal life and make sure people see how grateful you are for eternal life because the world needs to understand the message. And then there's a third time Paul used this phrase, and it's in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, when he said, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. In other words, Paul was saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about the fact that you can't do God's will your way, but you're going to have to have a hunger for the work of the Holy Spirit to be experienced if God's will is going to be done in your life. And I want to share an illustration that might help us understand this this morning. When I was a kid, my dad had a master mechanical mind. It caused him to enjoy decades in the research department of PPG Industries. And uh, when I was coming up on 16, he decided he wanted me to 
have my own car. So he bought a car, but we had to get an engine from another car. And we were taking this engine and we were putting it in this car. And he had to tweak stuff that was going on in the engine. And he said, why don't you do it with me so I can train you? But then by the third night, he looked at me and he said, you know what, Jimmy? He said, here are your two jobs. You shine the light and you bring me the tools whenever I need them. And then he said, because I can't put into somebody what God left out of somebody. Can you say amen? And in the same way, listen, God wants to do a great work through our life, but we can't do it. We need God's help if he's going to do what he wants to do through our life. And the story that we study today is going to speak to us really deep about that. It's going to teach us the three ingredients of having a highly influential witness as a person. And it starts in Acts 2 verse 1 when it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and they were in one place. Now, first of all, why does the Bible teach us about the day of Pentecost? Well, it's because it was an annual feast in the life of Israel, one of three feasts that God commanded them to commemorate every single year. And uh, when God was giving them the feast, God was speaking his plan of salvation to the Jewish people through the feast. So let me talk about the three feasts for just a minute, that the first feast was the Feast of Passover, and it happened early in the spring, and it commemorated God's redemption of us. During the Passover, God told them, I want you to take a lamb that doesn't have any spots, doesn't have any blemish, and I want you to sacrifice that lamb, and if you do, the bondage of sin that came to you in Israel, I'm going to protect you from sin's curse, I'm going to take you into a new beautiful land if you'll learn to deal with sin's influence in your life. And of course, we know that Jesus was that spotless lamb who forgives our sins and who blesses our future whenever we honor him. It's why John the Baptist in John chapter 1, when Jesus was come to be baptized of John, John said, everybody, look, there's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of everybody who's in the world. But then there's a second feast that God told them to celebrate, and that's the feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost happened in the latter part of the spring, and God would have them celebrate the fact that we live on a planet where if you plant seeds, take care of them. If you prune trees and you take care of the life well, you can enjoy satisfying fruit in your life. But it wasn't just to symbolize that, but there was a spiritual meaning to this feast as well, and that is people are called like trees in the Bible. And sin destroys the fruitfulness of people's lives. And we as believers are called to bring into people into salvation so that sin doesn't rob them of fruitfulness in their life, but they enjoy the fruitfulness God brings into their life. And so Luke said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, on this day whenever God showed us that the total purpose he had in his heart for Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on the church. Now there's a third feast in the Bible that again God shares his plan of salvation through and it's the Feast of Tabernacles and it commemorates our pilgrimage and the fulfillment of God's plan for our life. This particular feast happens in the fall and it begins with a blast of a trumpet on a day called Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year or the beginning of a year and then they begin to celebrate all the redemptive history they have as God's people. And uh, I don't know if you thought about this, but Jesus came during the Feast of Passover, right? He was sacrificed for our sins during Passover. And then today we're going to see that the church was born during the Feast of Pentecost, whenever God was talking to us about, you know, the harvest of souls we're to bring to him. And I personally believe that Jesus is going to come back during the Feast of Tabernacles because God began it with the blowing of a trumpet. And listen to the scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, the Lord himself 
himself on that day will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and then the dead in Christ are going to uh, rise first. You know, I drove a convertible for years. I loved that convertible and I drove it until Jeffrey was 16 and he looked at me one day and he kind of has woo. Have y'all noticed that? And he talked me into giving me him my convertible and then he wrecked that convertible. Man, I had to forgive him for wrecking my convertible. But I used to drive in that convertible and I'd just put the hood down in the fall and I would look up and I'd say, Lord, could this be the year? And I know we don't know the time or the day that Jesus is coming, but we are supposed to think about the seasons that Jesus is coming. And can I tell you one thing I know for sure? I know for sure that one day he's going to be blowing and on that day I'm going to be going going, y'all, into the best years that I've ever lived my life. Amen? And God wants us to know, listen, there, there's stuff important going on in the world. It's called God's work. And he's been at work from the foundation of time. And here's the cool part. He gives you and me a part in this work that God has, has, wants to get done in the world. So much so that Jesus says, when we do God's work, we enter into the joy of our master. In other words, when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to have great joy over what his life accomplished and what it meant. And in the same way, the book of Acts was written so that you and I have that same kind of joy in eternity. And this morning, we're going to learn three things that will cause us to have great joy because of the influential witness of our life. But before we learn them, I want you to notice that in the first couple of Sundays, we learned Acts chapter 1 verse 1 through verse 11, and we learned that God's kingdom begins to spread like wildfire through people who learn you can't have a fearful witness. you got to have a faithful witness. You have to have God embolden you because persecution and various things can keep you from being a bold witness. You need to have a, a witness empowered of the Holy Spirit because there's a difference when you're speaking versus when God is speaking through you. And then last week we learned that we have to have an engaged witness, that you have to be concerned about the people people who are in your world, and you have to take advantage of those opportunities that God has given you. Now, this morning, we're going to learn how to express our faith in a way that is highly contagious as people, and it's kind of humorous to me that when you read the book of Acts, remember that Luke was the only Gentile author in the Bible, and when you read the book of Acts, it's clear that he, he kind of is upset that the church, with an understanding of eternity and what that that means that we're not more faithful to really do what God has called us to do in terms of witnessing. And so I think he throws in this story between Acts chapter 1 verse 12 and Acts 26 to kind of show us how the church wasn't where it needed to be in terms of its relationship with the Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost happened. You say, well, tell me the story, Pastor. Well, it started in verse 12 and it begins to tell us how, you know, Judas had had obviously hung himself, and because of that, they had to choose another apostle to have 12. And verse 23 says, so they nominated two men, Joseph, who was called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart, so show us which of these two you've chosen. Well, what if it wasn't one of those two, right? I mean, it's a pretty good prayer, but we're going to pick two, Lord, and you tell me which one you pick. Now, I do know people who get married that way. Can you say amen? Or they start dating somebody that way. God, if you made them beautiful, I can make them holy. Just show me which one you really want me to marry, right? But listen, it's clear that they weren't coming saying, God, just show me who it is that, that, that you've called for this, play, this, this position. Then it gets worse. It says that they, they pray next, God, show us who you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belonged. 
belongs. Can you believe they said that about him? He, he's going where he really belonged to go. And then next it says that they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Who can tell me what the ministry of Matthias accomplished in the earth? Would you wave your hand? Not, not wave to not be hot anymore, but I mean like wave it because you want to tell me something. You can't do that. And you know why? Because there's nothing in the Bible, nothing in church history about what the ministry of Matthias accomplished. And I think Luke put this in, a, in here for a reason to let us know that, you know what? If people aren't called, if they're not graced, if they're not anointed, they're not going to accomplish the things that are so important to them in eternity. And then we come to Acts chapter 2, and he begins to tell us how this church went from being people who were behind uh, closed doors that were locked because they feared people. And it became this explosive church that brought salvation to the entire world. And he gave us three things to think about. Number one, he talked about how they honored God's presence. It says on the day of Pentecost, when it fully came, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, notice it wasn't a mighty wind. It wasn't something that came into the room, blew things around everywhere so that people had to put it back. It was just like a wind, and they all looked at each other, kind of freaked out, saying, man, do you see what this is? This crazy wind is blowing in the house. And that is because wind symbolizes something in the Scripture. If you read in, first of all, in, uh, in 2 Kings 2, verse 1, when Elijah went to heaven. The Bible says that God wanted to do twice as much through the ministry of Elisha. So what did God do? He sent a whirlwind. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind to tell Elisha, he's going to heaven, but I'm still passionate about what I want to do. And then there's a scripture I love. It's in Job 38, verse 1. And Job is complaining about his life because he's lost his health, he's lost his family, he's lost everything everything that he worked for in his business, and he's complaining to God. And God speaks to him from a whirlwind. And you know what that whirlwind represented? It represented God's passion to do something about what Job had lost. And I got a word for some of you this morning. You might have lost some stuff, but listen to me. If you let what God does for you overcome what sin did, has done to you, you will rejoice like Job did, who got twice as much back. He got his health back. He got his money back. He got his family back because he honored the wind. Jesus, when he was speaking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus said, how do you do these miraculous works that you do? Jesus said back to him in John 3, 8, he said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it goes, and so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. In other words, if you want God to do wonderful things in your life, it really comes down to just honoring the wind inside of your heart. It comes down to honoring the voice of the Holy Spirit because where God's presence is honored, God's power is always going to be revealed. Now, here's the second thing that Luke talked to them about, and that is we not only honor God's presence, but we live with passion. It says, next, there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and they sat upon each one of the members who were there. So this was kind of cool. Again, it wasn't real fire, so nobody had their hair get burnt, and nobody had their head get blistered if they didn't have any hair. Can you say amen? But, but literally, it just looked like a fire, and a different tongue came, and it divided on each one of the people. Now, you say, why would God send a fire? Because, again, fire is symbolic of something in Scripture. Fire symbolizes the passion God has in his heart to get things done in our lives. And God wasn't calling them to be part of the blistered head fellowship or the burned head fellowship, but God was calling them to be part of the burning heart fellowship. You know who's in that fellowship? People like Moses, who the Bible says in Exodus 3, 1 and 2, he was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, who was the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and he came to Horeb, which was the mountain of God. 
God. This was the same Horeb where Moses would later uh, receive the Ten Commandments and receive from God his call to take them, you know, into a nation that was amazing. And the Bible says that when Moses was there, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And again, this bush didn't burn. Why? Because it wasn't a fire. It was just like a fire. And God was saying to Moses, I need the burning that's going on in the bush to burn on the inside of your heart because this isn't going to be easy, but people who have my will come to pass in their life are people who have my fire burning deeply on the inside of their hearts. Amen? Listen to the scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. It says, we're to serve God with, we're to serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. In other words, if we can serve him acceptably, acceptably, we can serve him unacceptably. And God says, here's how you serve me in an acceptable way. You have a reverence for what I want to do in your life. You have a godly fear. You're going to stand before me one day. And this passion forms in your heart that causes me to do powerful things in your life. And can I tell you something I've seen is if people truly honor God's presence in their life, the natural byproduct of honoring God's presence in your life is there's going to be a passion or a fire that forms in your soul. If you're lacking the fire for what God wants to do in your life, the keys to come back and to honor his presence more because his presence will bring the fire into your life. John said of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, he said he wants to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why do we need both the Holy Spirit and fire? Because we have things that don't allow the Holy Spirit to do what he can do in our life. Sometimes we fear persecution. Sometimes we lack discipline. Sometimes we get overcome with temptation. And we need fire inside of us that says, I'm not going to miss out on God's best. I'm going to see God complete his plan in my life. Can you say amen? And so if we want to have a witness that's hugely effective, it starts with honoring the fact that the Holy Spirit has chosen us to minister in our world. And he calls us to live with fire. Why? Because about 80% of people in the world come to faith through the witness of a family member and a friend. And if we don't have the fire, if we don't have the passion, there's a good chance that the people that we love the most are not going to be in heaven whenever they die. You know, I loved my father-in-law. I talk about him all the time. But I remember one day that really moved me. He was probably 75 within the last couple years of his life. And he'd given his heart to the Lord at 17. Like me, he was the first one in his family to become a fully devoted follower of Christ. And so it would have been easy for him to go back into the pleasures and the temptations of his friends. It would have been easy for him not to answer the call of God because he didn't really have a family that was encouraging him. But he started preaching right away at 17 years old. And he preached for 60 years. And I was with him on at at year 58 of those 60 years. And he looked at me one day and he started celebrating the fact that God had done more through his ministry. God had saved more people in the last decade of ministry than he saved in the first 50 years of ministry combined. And then he looked at me and he said words I'll never forget. He said, Jim, when you got snow on the roof, that's when you should have the most fire in the fireplace. Come on, somebody. That's why God used him the way he did in that last decade. And I want to encourage you that today is the day for you to say, God, I'm going to honor how important my witness is in the world. And God, I'm going to live with a passion. I'm going to be part of the fellowship of the burning hearts. Can you say amen? And then there's a third thing that God says, and that is once we honor his presence and once we live with passion, we have to engage the people in our world. The story continues and said they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it says there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speaking in their own language. In other words, you notice they weren't speaking their own words, but they were speaking words that the Holy Spirit gave them to speak to others that would have impact. And it's interesting in the text, two things happened. Number one people got confused. You know, when you start living passionate for Jesus, people who knew you before Jesus, they're going to get confused about how you're living. I remember when I was 17, gave my heart to Jesus, the principal in my high school called me in, and he said, listen, what is up with you? He said, I've been cheering for you in basketball games and baseball games forever, and you're like a different person. What happened to you? And I said, Mr. Hilgert, all I can tell you is you see the craziness. You see how my friends and I are partying, and we're, you know, we're doing stuff we shouldn't be doing. And honestly, I just woke up, and I realized maybe Jesus is the answer to all this, and I'm not going to stop until I find out, found out. And so they start out confused, but then notice what happens. It says that they were confused when they heard them speaking, but then they were amazed and they marveled, saying to one another, look at all these people who are Galileans, and how is it we hear them speaking in our own language in which we were born? In other words, these people were speaking to their culture, they were speaking to their identity, they were speaking to the place they were born. And in the same way, when we get saved, listen, we get born again out of a bad sinful culture. And you know what? Young moms can speak to young moms about the difference Jesus makes and they'll listen. Business people can speak to business people about the, the, the difference Jesus makes and, and they'll listen. Coaches can speak to other coaches about the difference Jesus makes and they'll listen. If your marriage is broken, Jesus can bless it and he can heal it. And you know what? You'll start speaking to other people that God wants to birth those same kind of miracles in their life. And that's what God wants his church to be. Listen, the reality is people are really, really skeptical. They, they don't feel like they can trust everybody. But whenever you live for Jesus, the people in your world, they know they can trust you. Can you say amen? Some people won't listen to other people because they don't think people care for them. But the people in your world, they know you care about them. And that's why you're such an important witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that that salvation spread rapidly for two reasons. Number one, everyone engaged those that they had relationship with, everyone they had affinity with. And then number two, everyone was anointed of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit began to speak powerfully through all of them. And the Bible says there were two responses in Acts chapter 2. There was cynicism, and there's going to be some cynicism. When you start sharing your faith more, people are going to mock you. They're going to say, you're crazy. But then there was all there were also a lot of conversions because the people were bold and they were witnessing and they were speaking God's message so well. And I just want to say this, the conversions are worth putting up with the cynicism. Can you say amen? In fact, some of us would do, it would do us good to go back and read some of the people in history who made the biggest difference. For instance, you can read about Ignatius in the first century. You can read about Justin Martyr and Irenaeus in the second century. You can read about Tertullian in the second and third century, who wrote a seven-volume work on the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. And then you can come up to John Wesley, and I want you to read, the, to hear something John Wesley wrote in his journal back in 1950. He said, the grand reason why the miraculous gifts were so soon withdrawn from the church was not that faith and holiness were well nigh lost, but that dry, formal, orthodox men began even then to ridicule whatever gifts they had not themselves and to, to decry them as if they were madness or imposture. In other words, God doesn't call us to sit in a formal setting, living formal Christianity without passion in our hearts. God calls us to realize there's an eternity, and there are people who trust us to tell them the truth. 
There are people who know we care about them. And if we care about them, we got to tell them about Jesus Christ and how important it is that we honor him in our hearts. Can you say amen? And it's not always easy. I remember when I was, you know, in my 20s, I was a missionary. And I had come back to my parents' home for a couple weeks until I was going to go back to the mission field. And I used to love sleeping in my childhood bed, eating all the meals my mama made me. I would gain eight pounds in a week, y'all, just eating my mama's food. It was awesome. And I remember one night I was just enjoying myself, and, and I was trying to learn to play the guitar back then, so... I was in my bedroom, and I decided I was going to spend some time in worship and prayer before I went to bed. And so I was playing this old hymn. It's called, Thou Art Worthy, O Jehovah. And I'm belting it out on the guitar, and my mom peeks her head in the room. And she says, oh, no, Jimmy, you haven't become a Jehovah Witness, have you? <laughs> she didn't know, y'all. She didn't know. I spent seven years as a believer, and I was a missionary, but I never helped my mom sort through the stuff that was going on on the inside of her heart. And I remember that night before I went to bed, the Holy Spirit really started dealing with me about, you need to do better. This is serious. And so I started praying for her while I was on the mission field. And it was cool how God really intersected her life with people who were in our community whenever I started to pray. And I obviously had some real good conversations with her. And I actually asked her to forgive me because I told her, I said, I never wanted you to feel like I was dishonoring my heritage when I talked to you about Jesus. I'm just trying to help you understand who he is and what he means to my life. And then what really got her was the moving of the Holy Spirit. God began to give me words when I was on the mission field. And I would call. For instance, my grandfather got sick, and he was in the hospital. He'd never been in the hospital in my lifetime. And I said, Mama, is granddaddy sick? And she said, how in the world do you know this? I come from a family with very little divorce. But God spoke to me one day, and he said, your oldest sister and your brother-in-law, Jack, they're, they're going to attorneys. They're close to divorce. I didn't even know they had a problem. I called my mom, and I said, Mom, are Karen and Jack going through marriage problems? Are they talking divorce? Again, it was just quiet on the other end of the phone. And I'll never forget flying back from the mission field. And my mama hugged me. She was so glad I, I was home because I looked like a POW the way I was eating on the mission field. And she planned on fixing that, but she looked at me and she said, Jimmy, she said, I'm so sorry. I was stubborn. She said, it's amazing how God has loved me and spoken to my heart. And she said, I don't want you to go to bed until you and I pray and I make Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of my life. Here's what I didn't know, y'all. That was December of 1984. One year later, my beautiful, healthy mother, I never saw sick a day of her life, contracted cancer. And by December of 1985, my mama was in heaven. And how many of you know I'm glad she's there and I'm going to eat some good food whenever I get there, y'all, right? God wants us to live honor in his presence. God wants to live us, us to live with passion. And God wants the Holy Spirit to work through us. And how many of you are glad because of that we can see a lot of cynical people come to Jesus? And go up to heaven with us. Amen. Hey, can we give him a good hand clap of praise this morning? Can we do that? Just thank him. And then would you just lift your hands to heaven? Whatever it is that is a sign of surrender. Maybe you just want to bow your head at your seat. Maybe you want to lift your hands to heaven. But would you say this with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, help us take the call of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit more serious in our life. Lord, make me part of the fellowship of burning hearts for your glory and for my reward. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Now let's all just keep our heads bowed, our eyes closed. I want to pray for some other really important people who are here today. 
Man, maybe you're here and you're like I was at 17. Maybe you say, you know what, Jim? I believe in Jesus. I know he came. I know he did miracles. I know that history's literally been defined by who he is. But you know what? I'm not 100% sure that if I died, I'd spend an eternity with God in heaven. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. And let me just say this. You're not going to get to heaven by good works. Because if you could get to heaven by good works, then guess what? Jesus wouldn't be the Savior of all mankind. Good works would have saved some people. But the good news is that no matter how many sins you've committed or how few sins you've committed, God loves you. And he wants to forgive you. He wants heaven to be your eternal home. And the Bible says if you ask him for forgiveness of sin, he'll give you the gift of eternal life. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not 100% sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I want to know that. Would you pray for it? I'm going to count to three. Just shoot up your hand. We're going to pray for you at your seat this morning. Are you ready? One, two, three. Shoot up your hand if that's you. You're ready to go to heaven. You want to make that decision. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? You say today, man. I don't know. God bless you. Thank you, ushers. God bless you. God bless you. No more important decision in your life. It's why the Bible says today, not tomorrow. Once you know who Jesus is, respond to him. Don't let anything talk you out of the most important decision in your life. Is there anybody else? Will you just lift your hand? Awesome. Right there. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, I'm going to give a second invitation this morning. And that is, if you've served God, in your life but you know your heart isn't where it needs to be and today you want to say to God God I'm going to consecrate my heart to you I'm ready to serve you I'm ready for your will to be done fully in my life Lord I've strayed and I want to serve you wholeheartedly again if that's you I want to pray for you as well so one two if it's time for God to shine if you're ready three shoot up your hand all over this place Awesome, 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 fantastic, fantastic. Okay, church, you can look up at me, and I want you to put your hand on your heart, <clears throat> and you may say, well, Jim, why did you pray that second prayer? Because how many of you know when believers get consecrated to Jesus, a whole lot of people end up getting saved when believers consecrate their, their lives to Jesus. Amen? So I want to pray this morning for people just coming to Jesus. I want to pray for people consecrating your life to Jesus. And I want to tell you this story, and then we're going to pray for everybody. But I've got a good friend. And this week he said, man, Luke's writing has have been messing with me. He said, I recognize God doesn't just want me to be instructed in church. I, I'm to bring influence as the church. And so he started praying, God, where does my witness need to be bolder? God, who do you want to empower me to speak to? God, I don't want to live unconcerned. I want to engage. Who do I talk to? So God brought up two friends he knew 30 years ago. He got in touch with them this week, called them, and at first they just caught up. You know, they hadn't talked in a while. Then they started remembering some of the fun they had. And then it got candid. He started praying for them. And then he started talking to them about Jesus and salvation. And two of his friends got saved, y'all. How many of you think that's pretty cool, right? This week. Now, here's what I'm praying. I'm praying for God to multiply that. How many of you want to see that multiply through all of us, right? In the days ahead. So come on, let's pray. Let's put our hand on our heart. Let's say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming to earth. So we'd know how loved we are and how incredible your ability to bless truly is. Today, Lord, I say no to sin and I say yes to you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In your name I pray and all God's people said, Amen. Hey, can we give all those who prayed a great big hand? And would you all stand to your feet? We're going to sing our closing song this morning. Let me encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, God has a great future uh, in store for you. All it takes is obedience. You give God obedience, he'll give you blessing. 
And we want to help you with that. So on your way out, we've got a white packet. It has some gifts for you. I uh, want to encourage you to grab it. And then we want to encourage you to be baptized because Jesus said, believe and be baptized. Everybody say, believe and be baptized. And baptism is the first step of obedience we take. And obedience is why God blesses our lives. So let me encourage you. You can text that number. You can scan the QR code. Or you can use a salvation card on your seat back if you have a pen today. We're going to be baptizing next Sunday. So we hope you'll be a part of it. Amen. Now I see you all that I God says he once spoken over your life on a constant basis, wants us always reminded of it. Remember too, Jeffrey and Eden are in the Connection Center if you want to see them or if you want to drop a card to them. There's some cards out there. But let me speak this blessing. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. Thank you for honoring God with your heart and your life. Amen.